Welcome to the Hold the Line podcast. Sean Foy here with my great, amazing friend, all the way on the East Coast, Eric Metax. Look how smiley he is this morning. Hey, Eric, how are you? I'm always happy to be with you. You have been, uh, <laughs> God has used you, Sean Foyt, to encourage me. Uh, people often say that I encourage them, and I always talk to them about the handful of people that have encouraged me. You're one of those people, and I just uh, really appreciate you and what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, likewise, I, I, I really, you know, I'm excited to talk about this film today. I'm excited to talk about what you're doing. I'm so grateful that when we were capturing super spreader you know that came out uh what was it almost two years ago that you were such a huge part of that and uh you know we're willing to come our film super spreader that came out it was top five movies in america the weekend it was released and you know shared our story of let us worship and you were able to help really lay a baseline foundation for why this is such a crucial hour in america to rise up and so thank you, thank you for that. I know that this film that you're doing just builds upon that, and we need it. We need to hear what you have to say. So why don't you give us an update? Share, share with us. Yeah. Well, um, listen, uh, it's about saving America for the Lord's purposes, you know? Uh, and we understand we're now in a spiritual war. Uh, I say I have a yep. book coming out, sequel to Letter to the American Church called Religionless Christianity, God's Answer to Evil. It's coming out the end of April. And I basically make the case that we are uh, we're in the third existential crisis of our nation's history. The first is a revolution. The second was a civil wow. war. And we're in the third war. right now. It is an all out war. It's a spiritual war, but it's an existential crisis in the sense that we cease to exist if we win. This is not like yeah. uh, if we lose, this is not, you know, hey, let's see how it goes. This is this is for all the marbles. And it's a grim thing, but it's where we are. And I believe it's the Lord has allowed right. us to come to this place and that things have gotten so bad that many in the church who have been asleep are waking up finally and understanding I need to do something. So the idea yeah. behind my book, Letter to the American Church, which we've talked about, is that the parallels to Germany in the 30s are they're sick. I mean, it's exactly right. the same thing. You have a church that says, oh, we don't want to be politically involved. We just want to play church. We just want to do right. church on Sunday morning. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to be controversial. That inability to have a biblical view of the role of the church and to act out on what we claim to believe that opened the door to hell on earth and led to the death camps. But way before that, um, you could see people saying, well, we don't, we don't know how this is going to go. We're just going to, we're going to sit this one out. We're going to be neutral. That's what opened the door to hell on earth in the thirties. I wrote about it in my Bonhoeffer book and I write about it in the letter to the American church. That's what's happening in America today. You've got a lot of pastors who are either, maybe they're not woke, but they're open to wokeness, or maybe they're not even that open to wo wokeness. Maybe they have a quote unquote biblical worldview but they're not willing to do anything about it. They're not willing to be fighters. They're not willing to be heroic, self-sacrificially living out their faith in action. They just say, no, 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 we're just theological. We just preach the gospel. We just do church. And we're living at a time when that is exactly what the German church did in the 30s, that if you do not understand that there's a biblical mandate for you to live out your faith, to call out corruption and evil, to stand against yeah. corruption and evil, to fight against corruption and evil. If you don't do that, it's proof you have no real faith. You can't fool God. You can't say, I have faith, but then don't live it out. But a lot of American Christians, as I call it the American heresy, have adopted this narrow theological view. That is the devil's theology. If you're going to a church yeah. that is looking the other way, saying, we don't want to be in this fight, we just want to do church. Um, that's the devil's church at this point. You're serving the devil just as the German churches unwittingly were serving the devil by doing nothing, doing nothing, doing nothing, and then wham, game over. You've now been neutralized. You've yeah. been defanged, declawed. You can't fight even now if you wake up finally and say, oh, we, we better do something. Now it's too late. Right. That's what the American church is. So the book um, has done very well. It's been a bestseller since it, it, since it came out. And some... Um, People said, you know what, we need to make a documentary film. 
So they made a documentary film. It's spectacular. I didn't make the film. I just wrote the book, but it's called Letter to the American Church. And we are doing free screenings in any church in America that wants a free screening. Any church in America. So if folks go to letter to the American church.com. It's all there. You can already see the list of churches that are doing free screenings if that's in your neck of the woods. But you know, Sean, I say like, if your church is not interested in a free screening, um, why are you interested yeah. in going to that church? Why are Christians complicit with evil? They kind of act like, well, it's not me. It's my church. We've been going there, yeah. you know, for decades. And I think, well, why? I mean, if you're going to a mosque or, or, or you know, would you say, well, my family this is just where my family goes. We're in a war. People need to, you know, yeah. uh, understand we're in a war i uh th this hits really really it, it hits home to me in in a lot of different ways not just because i love you and the way that you write and the, the book is phenomenal by the way i've sent it out to so many people and made my wife read it and and it's 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 incredible you have such a gift and an anointing to to sound the alarm you know that we need to hear but this is personal for me because, you know, I grew up as a missions kid. My parents are full-time medical missionaries who traveled around the world. And I grew up with the world perspective. I didn't care that much about America. I mean, I loved America. But, you know, I, 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 I wanted to bring the gospel to the nations of the world and follow in my parents' footsteps. And so I did that, <clears throat> you know, went to, you know, seven of the top ten most closed persecuted nations on earth raised up missions movements, raised up worship movements. And then a funny thing happened, Eric, when when I started having kids and uh, I had three kids, my wife was pregnant and I was looking at the, at the state of America. I was living in California on this record label, uh, you know, ascending, you know, my the ministry ladder and, you know, getting my albums out there, writing with everybody, all the famous, amazing writers in the Christian music industry. And I started to notice like, gosh, this stuff that's happening right now in California, right now, and, and it's like, how are people letting this happen? And then I started to do a deep dive into how people weren't voting, how people weren't engaging. And so I really felt like, and it was foolish, but I, I knew I was, I had to do something uh, that I should just run for Congress. And so I, I did the most ridiculous, stupid thing ever. I was the long haired worship leader that challenged uh, the longest incumbent in, in, in Congress at the time uh, in, in, a, in a very blue Bay Area district. Um, and this is what I discovered, Eric, and I wanna tie it back into this movie in, in, in your book. I had this crazy thought, this crazy naivety that I was like, man, I got pull with these churches. I have mobilized worship across this region. The moment that I announce that I'm going to take a stand for what we all believe in, like I'm not some crazy, you know, conspiracy right wing fanatic. Like I am a Christian and I have proven my track record of standing on the Bible and the things of God. I had this naivety that I'm like, I'm going to get these churches mobilized because I knew all the mega churches in, in the region that I was running in. I went to D.C. They said, they said, how do you think you're going to win this race to flip this seat? I said, I'm going to get the church to vote. I'm going to get them to rise up. And I gave them the numbers. Eric, they laughed me out of the building. They said, are you kidding me? Everybody knows the church doesn't vote. The church doesn't care. If you want to gather for a prayer meeting or a worship concert, you can do yeah. that. But you're not going to get the church to vote. And I left D.C. and I go, I'm going to go prove it to them. I'm going to go prove it to them. I came back to the district, busted my butt for months. And... Sadly, they were right. The church did yeah. not vote. And if you and if you look at this, and if you look at the statistics, and I, I published an op-ed called um, "Defining Christian Nationalism" uh, a couple days ago. Um, if I you look at the stats, fantastic, by the way, yeah, there's 20 million evangelicals that are eligible to vote that don't vote in a presidential election, and. So I want to talk to you about where is the disconnect and why is there such a lack of simply participation among Christians well, engaging you, in the democratic process? There's good reasons. There's bad reasons. There's reasons in between. Um, I was at the NRB. Uh, you're you're going to laugh because you and I spent time with Donald Trump at Bedminster a couple of years ago. 
And honestly, like Trump is such a character, he's funny to just to talk to, right? He called me handsome. Don't what? Yes, I, I was there. I, I, I heard that. <laughs> uh, and um, I was just, I was, I was at the NRB recently, National Religious Broadcasters in, in uh, um, Nashville. And um, Trump came and he spoke and I was having a bad day and I was kind of like sitting there in the front row uh, off to the side listening. Right. And it's so funny because I was thinking if you were there with me, you we would have been mocking it together. Right. Because he's everything he's saying is good, but he doesn't speak the evangelical language. So he has speechwriters who are totally out of touch. <laughs> so they're, 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 you know, they're ticking off all the stuff that we got three Supreme Court justices and we moved the embassy to Jerusalem and that, 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 that. All great stuff, right? But he doesn't speak the language. So he'll say stuff like, we need to bring religion back. <laughs> or we need more Christianity. And you think like, evangelicals don't, we don't talk like that, right? Like that's kind of like religion, <laughs> right? But so he's, he's saying this stuff, he's saying this stuff. Then he, uh, so, so he needs, you know, like speech writers or whatever, you know, who are more like you or me who could help him. Right. But that's not the real issue. The real issue is just to show how out of touch Trump is with evangelicals in that's not his fault. It's the fault of the evangelicals. So you'll understand what I'm saying. He then tells a story that I've heard him tell. I don't know how many times that, you know, in 2015, I brought these evangelicals to Trump Tower and I said to them, you know, I want your support. Will you endorse me? And they all got this weird look on their face. Like we, uh, we, we don't, we don't do that, but they didn't even say it. So later on he asked somebody and, and this person explains to him, oh yeah, all these pastors, yeah, they don't do endorsements. They don't do politics. And Trump was like, well, what do you mean? Like, what are you talking about? They're leaders. They, they should be able to help their flocks make decisions and what, right? It's a free country. We have free speech. What are you talking about? And somebody says, oh yeah, there's this thing, the Johnson amendment, you know, this corrupt bum Lyndon Johnson in the 50s in the Senate uh, put in this thing because he didn't like some Christians saying nasty stuff about him because he was a corrupt monster. And so he said, we'll get him and we'll get the IRS to make a rule that if you say anything political uh, or endorse somebody from a pulpit, we'll remove your 501c3 status. So that's totally wicked. I write about that in the book. Churches should have raised holy hell in 1954. Did they? No, they didn't. They let it go. And then they kind of internalized this satanic view that they're not supposed, it's un-American, it's unchristian. Churches internalized. They said, yeah, we don't want to do politics. So this gives us a convenient out. So we, we can't do politics. So we're not going to talk about it. So Trump at the NRB, this is a week or so ago, says, so I like rescinded that. I put an executive order against the Johnson Amendment so pastors are free to speak and endorse. Great. And he says, and if I get back in in 2020, I'm going to make that official, not just an executive order. So you can all, you know, share whatever from the pulpit. So Trump is saying this. I'm like, you know, watching him. And I'm thinking there's one problem, Mr. President. Many of the pastors you're talking are gutless. They don't care uh, if you are helping them speak. They don't want to speak. They're timid. They don't want to tick off some big tither in their congregation. They have a board of elders that are stupid, ignorant, out of touch, don't care about what's biblical and what's heroic to save America. They're going to say, oh, no, we don't do that. And I thought to myself, you can never call Trump naive because he's not. He's brilliant. He's amazing. He's a warrior. But he doesn't realize that he's talking to evangelicals, many of whom are guilty of silencing themselves, even if he goes to bat for them and 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 crushes the uh, the Johnson Amendment, they're still not going to speak up. So I'm going to write a piece about this called "Trump is Not Enough" because Trump, you know, is doing these things. But if the church, it's why I wrote the book "Letter to the American Church" and why we made the film "Letter to the American Church." If the church does not wake up and speak up and speak out and go to bat for candidates like yourself and others who are running, it's over. Th this is exactly what happened in Germany. And it is, you know this, Sean, it is shameful. It is why we made the film. It's why the film is free to any church that wants to do a screening, free. We need to make our money back, but I'll tell you what, 
We care more about saving the country. So any church that wants to do a free screening, you go to lettertotheamericanchurch.com. You can fill out the form. There's tons of free screenings across the country. But we are in a battle, and many of those guilty, you just said it, evangelicals, evangelical leaders, they are part of the problem. They refuse to do what God has made it possible for us to do. What God commands us to do, really, is to live out our faith heroically. It's, it's, I call it the American heresy, the idea that you wouldn't vote or that you'd be afraid to endorse a candidate or to speak out you're allowing evil to win. And so when we say, how do these horrible things happen? God is pointing his finger at his own church. It's it's just an amazing thing. I'm getting a text message. I believe I am. <laughs> Could be the Lord. So I, you know, I think what's amazing is, is we have this, you know, we have this, this, I mean, we're reliant right now on people like the Supreme Court, on institutions to do what the church should be doing. Um, I mean, referencing even today, you know, they have to stand in the way and say, hey, listen, you can't block a candidate off off the uh, presidential ballot and, and allow people not to vote for them because you don't like them. Like, you, you actually can't do that. You know, we have to rely on politicians in the Senate uh, politicians to be the ones to stand up for uh, these crazy psycho abortion laws. We have, we're relying on political leaders like DeSantis in Florida to remove DEI, which is obvious racism. You know, like we like it feels like to me like we're 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 putting the the burden on a lot of these politicians to push these biblical ideas of justice. And, and, and righteousness for America. Thank God we have a few of them right now that are doing that. But even among those politicians, they get pushed back from Christians. Like, is it biblical illiteracy? Is it yeah. a lack oh, it's, of, like, it's like what, kind of what is it? Well, look, it's, it's theological ignorance, okay? When the German church in the 30s allowed the Nazis to rise to power, okay, they're opening the door to hell on earth, the churches, the Christians did it. Now, in retrospect, right. many of them said, oh, well, I guess we should have spoken up. Yeah, and you didn't. And because you didn't do what God was calling you to do, because you found some really, in many cases, despicable religious theological excuse, Bonhoeffer called it that. He, he said, this is right. nothing but cowardice. And you're finding these religious excuses. What is more demonic than a religious excuse for looking yeah. away while evil is happening? But there are people who are just, again, they bought the lie. And it's this is going over decades. They have some idea that we're not supposed to live out our faith in the political sphere. I'm here. You know, we don't have a lot of time. I'll just say it's from the pit of hell, folks. Yeah. That's Those are the same yeah. people who said, you know what? Uh, so Lincoln is running. Uh, he's against right. slavery, but I don't want to advocate for Lincoln from my pulpit because maybe I have some slaveholders in the audience. They'll get upset. And so, you know, the slaves can go to hell. Who cares about them? I just care about, you know, the tither in my congregation. You think God is not a judge? That he's not going to judge you yeah. for doing nothing when he gave you the power yeah. to do something? And he gives us the power to do something because he's God. But just think in the United States of America, we have legal power. People, patriots have died yeah. so that we can yeah. advocate. And you have Christians saying, well, I don't want to advocate. It is it is horrifying. And that's why I'm sounding the alarm. The book, of course, is Letter to the American Church, but the film is out there. It's it's a great film. I got to say, it's a beautiful documentary, lettertotheamericanchurch.com. I just, I, I keep saying to people, if you're going to a church that is part of the problem, get out for the sake of your soul. Yeah. If you're going to some church that says, well, we don't want to be involved in this kind of stuff. It's heresy. It is not biblical. It is not it, patriots have died so that you could advocate for the truth. No holds barred. And people like Donald Trump get this better than evangelical Christians. It's a shameful thing. And so uh, I, I just well, believe that there anytime are many. You, uh, anytime you abdicate space, right? anytime the church abdicates or retreats, which, by the way, is not biblical. The church always advances, always takes ground. But anytime we retreat and we abdicate, I mean, darkness comes. And, you know, I feel like even the weapon, weaponization of Christian nationalism and these other made-up 
stupid terminologies. The purpose behind them is to get is to get people to have a fear of men, is to have a fear of the mob, is to be like, ooh, I don't want to be one of them, one of those people. And so, you know, we shy away. It's the weaponization, and pastors and leaders perpetuate the weaponization from the left that yeah. make up terms like Christian nationalism in order yeah. to get us to not do what Christians have been doing for thousands of years, which is shining your light, <laughs> like shining your light, go into all the world and preach the gospel. All the world means all the world. It means DC. It means the Senate. It means all of, it means the political realm. I mean, Paul was very clear. Peter was very clear. Jesus was very clear. We have examples, you know, David, you think about David. I mean, talk about a Christian nationalist. <laughs> he built day and night worship in the center of his whole nation. I mean, he was the epitome of Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is just the devil's term for actual Christians. Let's be clear. They invented the term yeah. simply to demonize Christians and to uh, to bully Christians into inaction. Don't vote. Yeah. Don't get involved. We'll call you names if you do that. There are people around <laughs> the world, we've been in these countries, that they suffer torture and death. Yeah. for living out their faith. And Americans have become so comfortable, we're not willing to endure being called names. Uh, and listen, right. um, what's happening on our southern border, if you don't care about the rape trees being set up, Joe Biden is the rape tree president. It is the most despicable thing imaginable yeah. that for political power, they would allow people to be raped. Uh, all of this stuff that's going on. Hey, Christians, you have a voice. If you do not use your voice, if you do not do everything you can to fight this evil, you're complicit in the evil. So I say this as a warning to my fellow brothers and sisters, please, please consider this. Understand that the enemy just wants to keep you sleeping, keep you quiet, keep you quiet while he can do satanic things just as he did in Germany. It happened. It is happening here. People listening need to be a part of the solution. I just say to people, spread the, the website, letter to the American church.com. It is free, literally free to do screenings in churches, letter to the American church.com. We are in a war. Uh, and if Christians do not wake up in this hour, it is over and we will be to blame. We have no excuse. We dare to say we believe Jesus defeated death on the cross. If you actually believe that, you're going to live differently. You're going to live fearlessly, uh, and you're not going to uh, drink the Kool-Aid, the, the fake gospel that we're supposed to be nice and just go along with whatever. Uh, like a lot of megachurch pastors and a lot of Christian leaders are going along with this, and some of them are openly advocating. Uh, Russell Moore, David French, openly advocating um, for the liberal secular left, uh, appearing in Rob Reiner's evil film, God and Country, oh, Russell gosh. Moore, David French, Bill Vischer, they are, they are absolutely advocating for the silence of the church at a time when, yeah. when God is calling his people to rise up. So I, I just beg people, please go to lettertotheamericanchurch.com, spread the message. It is literally free to any church, um, but we've, we've got to wake up. And, and Sean, I, I, again, you're one of the few people that you've really encouraged me. You've been a warrior out there, but the Lord is calling warriors every day as things are just a nightmare around us. More and more people are waking up. So God bless you for doing that. And, you know, it's in the Lord's hands. It's in the Lord's hands. It is. Well, Eric, thank you, man. Love you. Honored to support you. Can't wait to watch this film. And uh, yes, everybody, let's 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 mobilize. Let's fill our churches. Let's watch this film. It's going to be incredible. Thanks for coming on, Eric. Love you, man. God bless you, my friend. Thank you.